ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम ज्ञान तिमिरां दास्य ज्ञानांजना शलख्य चक्षुन मिलित तस्मा श्री गुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोबिस्त स्थापित मेन भूतले स्वयं रूप कदाम दधाती स्वापदी खम वंदेहम श्री गुरु श्रीयुता पद कमल श्री गुरुन वैष्णव श्री रूप सगजत सहागना रघुनाथ तन्वित तम सजीव सद्वेत सबदत वैजना सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य दीव श्रीराधा कृष्ण पद सहागना दलित श्री विशाखावित हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेशा गोपिका कांता राधा कांता नमो सुरे तप्ता कंचना गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी ऋषभानु सूर्य देवी नमामि हरे हरे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत दादर शिवा हरे गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे फर्स्ट वी वांट टू रिमाइंड एवरीवन मोर इज अ वेरी ऑस्पेशियस डे एक्सपीरियंस द लॉर्ड इन अ सिंगल डे all of you should come to the temple for lord narsinghadev for the celebration we all go to lord narsinghadev when we are in difficulty so we should also worship lord narsinghadev when we are not in difficulty <laughs> so we sang a bhajan very famous bhajan called shri krishna chaitanya prabhu daya kora more composed by a great vaishnava saint called narottam das thakur and in this prayer Narottam Das Thakur reflects the mood of a devotee. The mood of the Vaishnava is that he always considers himself to be the most fallen. Narottam Das Thakur says, "Etanya Mahaprabhu, please be merciful unto me. You are the most merciful of all incarnations. There have been many incarnations of the Lord. Etanya Mahaprabhu has been described as the most merciful of all incarnations." And Narottam Das Thakur further says, "You have appeared to save the fallen people, Pati Pavan Hetu Tava Batar. You see, people today are so degraded; they are engaged in so many sinful activities, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement has descended to save these people. And he says, 'All the fallen people, I am the most fallen.' Actually, Narottam Das Thakur." is an incarnation of a manjari manjari is an assistant to the gopi and the gopis help radharani in serving krishna so and he was born in a very rich family his father was a king in bengal 500 years ago and he was the only son and he was very attracted to chaitanya mahaprabhu's movement his father tried to attract him through so many lucrative offers but he was not at all interested and he composed many wonderful prayers glorifying chaitanya mahaprabhu and nitananda as the supreme personality of god so he says that i am the most fallen of all and then he prays to lord nitananda i was so happy that he had these deities of gornitai he says lord nitananda ah prabhu nitananda premananda sukhi lord nitananda you are in total bliss but i am very unfortunate i am very sad so you please be merciful unto me so that i can also become blissful and then he prays to the husband of sita namely advaita charya advaita charya is actually an incarnation of mahavishnu and it was advaita charya 
who pray for the who for Lord Chaitanya to descend. Advaita Acharya would sit on the bank of the Ganges, worship the Tulsi, and he was praying, the Lord, you please descend. People today are so degraded that unless you come, they will not be saved. Of course, Advaita Acharya was Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu can do anything, but he wanted the Lord to descend. So then he prays to Advaita Acharya and says that unless I get your mercy, I will not get the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. And then he proceeds to pray at the lotus feet of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, Ahasarup Sanatana and Rupa Raghunath. And he also prays at the lotus feet of Lokanath and Sarup Damodar. Lokanath Das was the spiritual master of Narutam Das Thakur. Lokanath Das only had one disciple, and that one disciple was Narutam Das. Actually, it's a very nice story of how Narottam Das got initiated. He approached, you all know that story? You want to hear? So Narottam Das approached Lokanath many times for initiation. But Lokanath Das say, you are so advanced, how can I initiate you? I can't initiate you. So he went on refusing. So, one day, Lokanath Das, after you know, in 500 years ago, people used to pass stool in the open field. So, Lokanath Das, after passing stool in the open field in Vrindavan, he went and hid behind the bushes. He wanted to see who comes and cleans this place. And then he went, he was hiding behind the bushes and he saw that after he would pass stool and go away, Narutam Das Thakur would come and clean the whole area up. So when he saw that Narutam Das was doing such menial service to him, then he agreed to initiate him. And he only initiated one disciple, and yeah? that is Narutam Das Thakur. So he prays to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan and uh, Sarup Damodar and Lokanath Das, his spiritual master, for their mercy. And then lastly he prays, I'm just giving you a very summary explanation because I want to proceed to explain something else. Then he prays to the mercy of Srinivas Acharya and he says, Ramachandra Sangha Mage Narottama Das. So Ramachandra Chakravati was a very great Vaishnava sage who was on the planet about over 500 years ago. Ramachandra Das and his wife, they were Grihastas, just like most of you are Grihastas. They were Grihastas, but they were such staunch devotees of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that Narottam Das Thakur prays, when will I have the association Ramachandra Sangha Mage Narottama Das? He says that I'm praying that I may have the association of Ramachandra Das because by Sadhu Sangha one can make spiritual advancement. So that was a brief explanation. I was thinking that on this trip a lecture on from a book called The Nectar of Instruction. Have you all seen this book? I'm sure you all have seen it in the bookstall huh? and on the book tables. So, this is actually a small book. It only has uh, 11 shlokas, but actually it contains the essence of a Krishna conscious philosophy. This book was written by Rupa Goswami and published as Sri Obdeshramit. So I was thinking that every evening in these house programs we'll take on one verse. We'll start with the first verse today. Tomorrow there's no program, then do text, two text, three text, four, and try and do as many verses as we can. It's a book that all devotees must study. Everyone who is serious about spiritual life, he must study Bhagavad Gita, must study Bhagavatam, Krishna book, Nectar of Devotion, and Nectar of Instruction. These books contain the essence of a Krishna conscious philosophy. Actually, the literature that we have is so vast that nobody, no other religious movement can compare to it. For example, if we talk about Christianity, you have one main book, the Bible, and you have some other book. You talk about Islam, you again have one main book. But in our Vedic philosophy, we have so many texts, and each of them is so detailed. And the texts left behind by the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, 
are the most voluminous in history. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself left behind only eight verses that we have, that we know as what? As Sikshastaka. But he instructed his followers to write volumes of books. Jiva Goswami was the youngest of the six Goswamis. He alone wrote more than 400,000 shlokas. Just alone. Forget what Rupa Goswami wrote, Sanatana Goswami wrote, Gopapata Goswami wrote the other. So we should try and understand the, the scriptures. Of course, we don't expect all of you to read all the Goswami literature, but at least we should start off with the most important of the Goswami literature. And the most important has been touched upon by Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada translated the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which has been published as Nectar of Devotion, and he translated Sri Upeshramit, which has been published uh, under the title of The Nectar of Instruction. So it contains very important messages for all of us. Nectar of Instruction was compiled by Srila Rupa Goswami. We are known as Rupanugas. Why are we known as Rupanugas? We are known as Rupanugas. Of course, in Washington, Rupanuga Prabhu was a DVC at one time. So you may think, oh, we are known as Rupanugas because we are serving in Washington. <laughs> now we are known as Rupanugas all over the world. Because we are followers of Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. Therefore, we are known as Rupanugas. And, like we are also known as Prabhupada Nugas. Because we also follow Srila Prabhupada. So, Ru Rupa Goswami, just to give you a little background, Rupa Goswami and his brother Sanatan Goswami, we all know that they were holding very important positions in society. They were virtually running the kingdom of Nawab Hussein Shah. Today, of course, Bengal doesn't have much uh, material significance, isn't it? Like the whole world wants to come to America today. Nobody wants to, very few want to immigrate to Bengal. Huh? There's no big rush of people standing in line to get a visa to go to Bengal. But you go all over the world, people are standing in line to get a visa for United States. Am I right? <laughs> they think that getting a visa for United States is like just one step short of going to heaven. Or many things. <laughs> so, about 500 years ago, Bengal was the richest kingdom on this planet. India was the richest country in the world, and in India, the, the richest province was the province of Bengal. And it was being ruled by a Mohammedan king called Nawab Hussein Shah. But the population was predominantly Hindus. So the king was a good diplomat, and he was looking for someone to run his kingdom, but someone who was very popular with the citizens. So he did a big research, extensive research, who should run my kingdom? And he, everyone said, these two brothers are very popular, Ahab and Sanatan. Rupa and Sanatan are the initiated names, but anyway. So the king finally asked them to run his kingdom. Initially, of course, they refused. They said, no, we are only interested in doing Krishna Katha, Bhagavad Katha. We are not interested in all this diplomacy and running out the kingdom. But the king said, if you don't run this kingdom, I'm going to destroy all the Hindu temples in Nagar. <laughs> so it was more out of concern that the temples be protected. The Rupa and Sanatana agreed to take on this responsibility, but they were running virtually like the prime minister and the, sec and the financial uh, treasury minister. They were running the whole kingdom. But Rupa Goswami uh, first gave up the service and then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sent him to Vrindavan to write books. He told them to, he told the Goswamis to go to Vrindavan, identify the places the Lord Krishna had performed his pastime, and to write books after studying the vast Vedic literature and explain the essence of the vast Vedic literature which they have done in their books. So Rupa Goswami is considered the leader of the Swami. So, he has presented this nectar of instruction or Sri Upeshwar. So we will read the first verse. I'm sure all of you have heard it before. You can try repeating after me. Vacha Vega Manasa Krodha Vega Vacha Vega Manasa Krodha Vega Jeeva Vega Mudara Pasta Vega Jeeva Vega Mudara Pasta Vega 
belly and genitals is qualified to make disciples all over the world. So, Rupa Goswami is first explaining to us what is the qualification of a spiritual master. Of course, eventually these are the qualifications of one who is serious about spirit, serious spiritual life. But Rupa Goswami says, only such a person can be entitled to make disciple who has control over the following vegam or pushing in the body. Vegam. Vegam means pushing in Sanskrit. So Rupa Goswami is saying, one who is serious about spiritual life must have control over the following pushing. First is vacha. Vacha means speech. So Krishna has given us this tongue. Majority of the people, if you ask them what is the purpose of this tongue, they'll say, speak without discrimination, which is known as prajalpa, and eat without discrimination. Isn't it? <laughs> That's what majority of the people think. And people love to use this tongue, isn't it? People love to talk, love to sing, so on. Now, you know what is the latest craze all over the world now? Who knows? <laughs> cellular phones. <laughs> now they have their cellular phones all over the world. All day people can keep talking, isn't it? I don't know how big a hit it is in America, but in India and Europe it's a big hit. I was just in London for a few days, almost everyone's over there walking around with a cellular phone. And the cellular phone companies make it really attractive for you. Like in England, you can have a cellular phone and after five o'clock it's free. <laughs> Local calls. So everyone says, oh, there's a great deal. After five or six, it's free. <laughs> so anyway, everyone loves to talk. Huh? You see people driving cars and, you know, speaking on the phone at the same time now. It's, even in India, it's caught on very well. It's become a status symbol in India now, cellular phone. So everyone carries a cellular phone. So, Krishna has given us this tongue. What should be the purpose of this tongue? We should use this tongue with the greatest of caution. The power, the watcher means speech. So according to the scriptures, the tongue should be used to glorify the Lord. Prabhupada used to give an example of the frog, Mendak. You have more Mendaks here? Frog. The frog croaks, huh? Makes can 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 can. And when it does can can, what does it do? Who does it send the notice to? Snake. Snake. It sends a signal to the snake. This is where I'm sitting. Come and attack me. And the snake identifies the location of the frog and goes and attacks. So we have this tongue, and this tongue should be used for something positive not for negative. So, we should use this tongue for chanting the names of the Lord, for glorifying the transcendental activities of the Lord, for talking about Krishna Katha. Many times we hear that Krishna appears to kill the demons. But Krishna doesn't have to appear just to kill the demons. Just like there are millions of people dying of heart attacks and other diseases, isn't it? Does Krishna come personally to kill them? <laughs> By the laws of nature they die. But Krishna appears more to create Krishna Katha, transcendental subject matters for discussion, pastimes with his devotees. Just like tomorrow we are going to celebrate the appearance of Lord Narsingha Day. This is a very unique appearance of the Lord. The Lord appears as half man, half lion. And he appeared as a half man, half lion. And he protected his devotee Prahlad. And he annihilated the powerful demon Hiranyakashipu. 
So this is just one of the many, many incarnations of the Lord. I don't want to describe the story today because we want to describe it tomorrow. <laughs> so the point is that the Lord appears to create Krishna Katha. Now some of you may say, Swamiji, we all do jobs, we are business people, we can't go and chant and do Krishna Katha in our office, isn't it? So what do we go, what do we have, what is your advice to us, what do we do? So the answer is, of course, you may have to be, you may have to make some adjustments, like obviously if some of you are working outside, you do jobs or business or you're students in a campus or whatever, you may have to engage in some what may be called professional talk or mundane talk. But we engage in mundane talk, professional talk, to the extent that it is necessary and not beyond that. You understand? That's the point. You don't extend, you don't use the terms beyond what's necessary for subject matters that are not directly related to Krishna. That is important. So some of the other, the term must be controlled. The power of speech. We may, we may talk about mundane subject matters, the professional subject matters, to the extent that is necessary in your job or in your business or whatever. But nevertheless, we should use the tongue also to vibrate the glories of the Lord. And our prime goal should be to engage the tongue in Krishna Katha. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives a practical advice. He gives an example of a lotus flower that is in water but it is not touched by the water. Have you heard of that example? Lotus flower that is in water but not touched by the water. So if our tongue is being used to vibrate the glories of the Lord, then even if you are in the material world doing a job, or doing business or studying academically, you will not be disturbed by it because the constant chanting of the holy names of the Lord, using the tongue to recite the glories of the Lord, will keep you in a spiritually safe position. So, Rupa Goswami says, one who is serious about spiritual life must control the power of speech. The temptation to speak nonsense will always be there. The temptation to indulge in mundane talk will always be there. But we must understand that time is of the essence. It is said that the rising and setting of the sun, the duration of life of everyone but one who surrendered to the Lord is being reduced. We don't ever realize that every morning when you get up, you're getting a signal that there's one day less left in your life. And in the evening when the sun sets, it has given you the message, one day less left in your life. But do any of us ever think like that? Except those are devotees maybe. <laughs> but by and large we don't think like that. The, sun, the rising and setting of the sun reduces the duration of life of everyone but one who is actually a devotee of the Lord. The so time is of the essence. Chanakya Pandit has said, Ayusha kashana ekopina labaya swarna koti bi. That even if we lose a minute, you will not be able to make it up with the wealth of the entire. Therefore, um, we must control our tongue, use our tongue practice productively for Krishna conscious activity. Hi Krishna. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare